Michael McCann, the legal expert for Sports Illustrated, joining us. Uh, Mike, help me with the what? I don't know what happened yesterday, but are we any closer to Donald Sterling moving moving out and Steve Ballmer moving in? Yeah, Dan, we're a lot closer to that happening, and that's because the judge in in Los Angeles, Judge Michael Levin, has decided that Shelley Sterling properly interpreted the trust in concluding that her husband was not capable of being a trustee, and as a result, she had the legal right to unilaterally strike a deal with Steve Ballmer to sell the team. He also rejected Donald Sterling's argument that he had revoked the trust, and more importantly than anything else, he decided that Under California law, Donald Sterling cannot block the sale through an injunction. Instead, he can only sue for money damages. So it was really a a, a clean sweep, in in a sense, for Shelley Sterling in the NBA. Now, it's not over. The legal process will continue. Donald Sterling will continue to sue. He could seek an injunction through another court. But the reality is that we're a lot closer to Steve Ballmer owning the team today than we were at this time yesterday. Okay, but isn't he suing the commissioner? He, he is suing the commissioner, but right now that lawsuit only centers on monetary damages. Okay. So, so but, it's not going to block the sale. Okay. What what could happen here before the start of the season? Or is, there's a drop-dead date in there, or isn't it mid-August, where uh, you know they, they have to have some kind of resolution with this, with Steve Ballmer? Am I interpreting that correctly? No, you're exactly right, Dan. On August 15th, the term sheet between Shelley Sterling and Steve Ballmer will expire, although that can be extended. But then there's that separate date of September 15th, where the NBA has said if no deal is struck by then, they're going to terminate the ownership of the Clippers, assuming 22, at least 22 of the 29 owners vote for it, and then the team would, then the NBA would auction the team off for sale. Steve Ballmer wouldn't be entitled to getting the team in that scenario, and Shelley Sterling has argued that the that the trust would be hurt in that situation because they may not get another deal worth two billion. What's next for Donald Sterling? I think his next step will be to somehow find uh, d- different courts to seek an injunction. He has to really stop the sale. At this point, suing for billions of dollars against the NBA and his wife and Adam Silver and anyone else, that doesn't fundamentally shift what's, what's coming at him, and that's that he's, gonna about, he's about to lose the team. And once he loses the team, it's gone. He's not going to get it back. He can go to court and sue over money damages. He has to try to devise a way to get a court to issue an injunction but the odds are decidedly stacked against him. He'll likely seek different avenues, but yesterday was really a major defeat for him. Is he allowed to go to games when this is done? At least not as an owner. Now, it's unclear if he were to buy a ticket and go to the game as a fan. I don't think the NBA would say that your lifetime suspension extends to purchasing a ticket because that's a separate license. Although, you know, the NBA has revoked, or at least individual teams have revoked licenses. We remember uh, the Detroit Pistons-Indiana Pacers fight where the fan involved in that fight was banned from ever attending another Pistons game. And I assume something like that could extend to Donald Sterling. But right now, my understanding of the lifetime suspension is that he can't have any involvement with an NBA team, but separately purchasing a ticket to me may be maybe beyond that he's michael mccann from sports illustrated their legal expert joining us dan patrick show uh let, let me shift to uh ray rice and even ben roethlisberger a couple of years ago when it comes to crimes when you're charged when uh you're not convicted um the legal process and then the nfl and their process here that this separation or the, are the lines blurred as far as you know, Ray Rice being charged, but then the NFL gets together. It, I, it almost felt like the legal system said to the NFL, you deal with this. Yeah, and then it could be interpreted that way because he was able to get admitted into an intervention program, which a, a critic would say was sort of a slap on the wrist by a court. Uh, and then as, as a result, the, the court was telling the NFL, you could argue, you take care of it. Now, I, I think a judge would say that that's not true, that that's not an accurate interpretation that the court system was proceeding on its own process. But you know, the NFL really has broader discretion over punishing players in any other league. It doesn't take a criminal charge. It doesn't take a lawsuit. It doesn't take anything. All it takes really is conduct detrimental to the integrity of and public confidence in the National Football League as interpreted by the commissioner and appeals can only go back to him. It really gives Roger Goodell complete discretion. Yeah, because if you appeal, you're appealing the suspension handed out by the guy that you're talking to about your appeal. 
Yeah, and this this is like having a trial judge say you're going to prison, but you can appeal, but the appeal goes back to me. That's not really <laughs> a credible appeal, right? But yeah. this is the system that the Players Association assented to through collective bargaining, so they can't complain about it now. Can you maybe not put them in the same sentence, but in the same paragraph, what Ben was charged with, Ray Rice, you know, they have to do with women. But as far as one getting six game reduced to four and one getting, you know, a two game suspension. So where do you stand on those charges? Well, I, I would say, you know, I imagine the NFL looked at this and said, with Ben, there was a pattern of conduct that was troubling. Whereas with Ray Rice, there was a, a heinous but apparently one time incident. And that as a result, Ben was being punished for you know, sort of a repetition mm-hmm. of, of mistakes in, in, in judgment. And that maybe the NFL had more information about that situation than the public learned. Uh, and as a result, maybe the, the league in its own investigation concluded more, you know, more troubling pieces of information than what we saw with Ray Rice. Although, you know, I get what you're getting at, Dan. It's pretty troubling to think that there's only a two-game suspension for dragging somebody by the hair. And I understand you know, he may have been provoked, but, but to me that's, that's not an excuse. If you're provoked, you call the police. You don't attack somebody and drag them by the hair. Michael, thank you. You got it, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Michael McCann, Sports Illustrated legal analyst.